On show 477, fix your own Tesla, Honda and GM's blockchain experiment, and why the UK government don't like plugins. Well, those stories and many more coming up on today's show. Hello and welcome to EV News Daily. Good morning, good afternoon, or indeed good evening. Wherever you're listening around the world, welcome to your programme for Monday 20th of May. My name is Martin Lee. I appreciate you tuning in today and listening to the EV News. What I do every single day, I go through all the news I can find and then just filter it down into the stuff I think you need to know about. Thank you, as always. MyEV.com is the world's first marketplace. It's in the US, and it's all about buying and selling and learning about EVs along the way as well. Check out the links to the forum on there as well if you'd like to be part of community. You can check out MyEV.com. Click on the Inside EVs forum. Get to it that way and uh, join some other like-minded people. So, are you a bit of a fixer-upper or are you the kind of take it to the garage and let them do what they do kind of person? I like to have I like to have a little fiddle as long as I know I'm not going to permanently break something or that my cars have got so old that I there's no point taking them to uh, not let alone the, the main dealer but even a garage for instance some of my previous cars I've done things like the oil changes and the air filter spark plugs stuff like that back in the day these days though would you fix your own EV Tesla has released a new do-it-yourself maintenance procedure a set of instructions to help owners work on their own cars according to Fred at electric today over the last few years Tesla has said that it's working on opening up its service tools and helping owners repair their own cars, but we haven't seen much evidence of that. In fact, quite the contrary. People that have been calling up saying, can I get hold of this part? Haven't always been too lucky. Things, though, have been slowly moving in the right direction. Tesla's now released the parts catalogue for Model 3, the S, the X, and the original Roadster. I was having a look at that earlier. I know what you're thinking. I need to get out more. But I was having a flick through the original Roadster parts catalogue. And they really do break it down into, you know, build your own roadster kind of thing. There's like literally every bit of it, like the inside of the wheel arches kind of thing where you can see all the bits that make it up. Anyway, enough about what I like to do in my spare time. Tesla owners who wish to perform basic procedures, says Tesla, or maintenance on their vehicle can do so without having to schedule a service appointment. Only perform a procedure if you feel comfortable doing so and always follow all provided instructions. So what are we talking about here? Restarting the touchscreen, pairing a Bluetooth phone, connecting to Wi-Fi, programming Homelink, adding and removing keys, replacing the key fob battery, installing the phone charging cable, installing the front license plate bracket, replacing cabin filters, checking and adjusting tyre pressures, topping up windshield washer fluid, replacing wiper blades, manually releasing the charge cable, calibrating windows, removing and installing aero covers, and removing and installing lug nut covers. One of the interesting things that uh, Tesla has done is make little GIFs, little GIF animations, and they kind of walk you through what you need to do. I watched the one for replacing the cabin filter, and I must say, it's not the easiest thing. You've got to take out two inside plastic panels, one of them with clips, one of them with five odd screws, a couple of electrical connections to take undo, a couple more screws, and the cabin filter is tucked right under the passenger footwell. Well, I guess right-hand drive models, when we finally get them here in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, other right-hand drive markets, then it's going to be underneath the steering wheel. But it's it's you know it's under there where your feet would go, and it's it's normally something that would have to go back to the service centre to do. But if you particularly want to change your cabin filter, now you can see how to do it again. I sat and watched that today. I know what you're thinking. He needs to get out more. Let's talk about Advanced Summon. Oh, by the way, I'll put a link, in case you are like me, I'll put a link to the Tesla parts catalogue in the show notes at epc.teslamotors.com. Back on the old Tesla Motors domain. That one, teslamotors.com. Let's talk about Tesla's Remote control feature for car retrieval, known as Advanced Summon. Almost ready for release, according to, you guessed it, a tweet. In a recent update on Twitter, Elon noted both the impending timeline that he was personally testing the self-driving feature this weekend himself. Advanced Summon is, is a set of new features and capabilities that allow Tesla drivers to command their vehicles to drive to their location through the Tesla app. 
writes Teslarati today. Well, earlier this month, they say Tesla released two lane departure avoidance features and emergency lane departure avoidance. It steers the car back into the lane after drifting without a turn signal. The features are derived from autopilot, but if you didn't spec autopilot on your Tesla, they now deem them to be safety features, therefore everybody gets them for free. I'll pop a link to Teslarati in the show notes if you want to read more. Honda Motor and General Motors will join forces in a research project that could determine whether electric vehicles can be used to stabilise the supply of power in the next generation of national power smart grids. According to Nikkei Asian Review, the partners want to develop ways to facilitate the retrieval of information, data that's exchanged between power grids and EVs. So how does the grid know whether you got home with 10% or 90%. It could end up giving EV owners an advantage as their vehicles become revenue streams. Down the road, EV owners could be earning those fees by storing power in your car battery and exchanging it with the grid as long as it all works seamlessly. Well, Honda and GM already jointly develop EV batteries for the North American market. GM last year sold about 20,000 units of its Volts Uh, and Honda is scheduled to start selling EVs in Europe this year with the Honda E. Uh, The two companies are now bringing their expertise in battery charging and power control to the next generation smart grids and vehicle to grid and things like that. I'll put a link to the website in the show notes if you want to know more. Previous interview on this program, on this podcast, if you're interested in V2G, have a look at Nuve, N-U-U-V-E. Go to my blog, evnewsdaily.com, use the search box and check out Mark Trahan from Nuve who've been doing V2G vehicle to grid longer than most. There's nothing he doesn't know about it, by the way. And they've got some more news this year, some bigger... I mean, they're constantly doing stuff as well. We're getting back on the podcast hopefully soon, and he can give us an update, because it's one of the things that I must confess utterly fascinates me. How can the motor car, the thing that used to ferry us from A to B, that gave us freedom, now take the place of a power grid, give us energy independence... Man, it's interesting stuff, isn't it? And it's not far away. Let's talk about subsidies, a hot topic, a hot potato and a contentious issue. After the cuts in this country to the subsidy programme announced in October, the Minister of State for the Department of Transport, it's a catchy job title, the name is Jesse Norman, now confirmed the grant is not being reinstated. Thank you to all my listeners that sent me this story, by the way. I appreciate it. When anybody sends me a story on the email, hello at evnewsdaily.com is my email address. This one coming from the industry newsletter, Elect. Drive. The updated grants last year had ensured that only fully electric cars get some free money. £3,500 subsidy, nothing to do with our taxes like in the US. Prior to that, though, the grants had also been included on plug-in hybrid cars, but they were got rid of. the. Well, they, they were, let me be specific about this, and I'm not reading off anything, and I've not done my research on this, but weren't plug-in hybrids included on the grant, but they had to do something like was it 50 or 60 miles and basically because there are no cars on the market which do plug-in hybrids which do that effectively it was taking the money away uh well the reasons if that's wrong by the way please correct me i mean i'm, I'm normally wrong uh their, the reasons for the update were not entirely clarified by the uk government but there are a few that have been uh, may have led to the, the decision of getting uh, taking the money away officially the government said The decision reflected the technological progression on the marketplace as well as consumer demand. Uh, Well, I agree and disagree. Technological progression needs to be encouraged. And if that is saying to people, yeah, you can have some money off your plug-in hybrid, but make sure that you're buying one that goes far enough, well, hopefully that would encourage automakers to actually make some plug-in hybrids with a really decent range, as well as having a combustion engine inside, actually a really decent range, not just your, your 10 or 15 miles. And then also the government saying that they take into account consumer demand. Sometimes you look at politicians and think you are doing everything you can to hold back the adoption of electrified transport. If it was a case of keep the grant, the subsidy, or take it away, you know what, if you really believe that you want more people to drive EVs, you would leave it there. In fact, you would raise it. But anyway, I'll pop a link to Electrive in the show notes. A company that many people really love to talk about is Sono Motors, S-O-N-O, Sono Motors, and their Scion 
Solar EV. Now 10,000 pre-orders for that over a year before the vehicle's production is going to begin. The German startup Sono Motors has had 10,000 pre-orders for its SEV. Those are some letters you may not have heard before. SEV, you've heard of BEV, battery electric vehicle. PHEV, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. MHEV, mild hybrid electric vehicle. But what about SE? There's many more. What about SEV, solar electric vehicle? Uh, Most of the reservations have been made by private individuals, 87% of them in Germany, Austria and Switzerland, according to Charge TV's magazine, where the Scion features a liquid-cooled 35-kilowatt-hour battery and a range of 155 miles bidirectional charging technology. So you can power electronic devices up to 3.7 kilowatts or 11 kilowatts on a Level 2 plug. That's your hairdryer, your straighteners... Your, your kettle, your coffee maker, all being plugged in at once into your car. Its most distinctive feature, 248 solar cells fully integrated into the body panels. And it can help just top up the battery charge. Never going to get your mega distance, according to Sono, uh, if you put it in the sunshine all day long, 34 kilometres of additional range which is nothing to sniff at. I'll pop a link to Charge DVs in the show notes if you want to read more about them. In the US, Chevron is adding EVgo fast chargers at their fuel stations in California. Well, EVgo announced a new project with Chevron following with the times it's now installing DC fast chargers at its gas stations in California. The first fast chargers were installed at the Menlo Park Chevron station and are now fully operational, says our friends over at InsideEVs.com today. Well, today, more than a dozen EVgo fast chargers from 50 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts in capacity are already operational or under construction, says Kathy Zoy. Now, Kathy Zoy is the CEO of EVgo, uh, saying that at five Chevron stations, they're offering convenient charging to EV drivers. These stations are located in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area communities in California, including Manhattan Beach, Menlo Park, and Venice as well, says Kathy Zoy. Fantastic. Well done to EVgo, getting more fast chargers in more places as well. And that debate that's cropped its head up uh, recently on this podcast is where do you put... DC fast chargers. Where do you put fast chargers for EVs? And I've pretty much always been a proponent of not putting them at existing filling stations because how you charge an EV is different. You charge it at home and at work, and if you're on a road trip, you charge them when you're on your way, in the middle of that road trip. And filling stations, at least where we, where I live, tend to be in built-up areas, and that's the worst place for an electric car charger. I say that, but because I have a driveway and a garage, all right for me to say that, isn't it? If you want to drive an EV, if you want to drive clean miles, but you haven't got a driveway, you haven't got a garage, let's face it, you might have some off-street parking, but someone's parked right outside your home, and besides, you can't trail a cable out your front window because somebody would trip over it across the pavement. Well, in that case, we need to find places in built-up urban areas to put DC fast chargers, and heck, maybe, uh, maybe filling stations is the place to go. I don't know. I remain unconvinced. Let me know your thoughts on any of today's stories. I would love you to take part in the conversation that happens every single day. I put this show on YouTube because people ask me to. It's weird. It's it's just the audio on YouTube. Hello to everyone that listens on YouTube. You're not weird, by the way. That came out wrong. I think it's interesting. It's a video platform, but so many, this little kind of sub-community of podcasters listen to audio through YouTube, and fair enough. If that's what you want to do, I'll put this show on YouTube as well. Uh, That does mean, though, that the comments section is probably actually the most active community on YouTube, so if you want to dive into the comments, that might well be the place to go. Of course, there's always Facebook. There's always Twitter. I spend more time on Twitter. I'm trying to be better at spending more time on Facebook. I'm totally out of the habit of even opening the Facebook app. And I know it's rubbish when I do once a week. People have left me messages. I'm sorry about that. I am trying. I am trying to be better at Facebook. Twitter, I'm on every half an hour. So uh, if that's the place that you are hanging out, you're more likely to find me on there engaging in the conversation and having a chat. But I'm going to be better at Facebook, I promise. So come and say hi wherever you choose to and take part in the conversation. And let me know your thoughts on any of today's EV stories. I really do love to read your feedback. And, you know, a lot of a lot of this is just I'm working it out as you're working it out. And it's just my opinion. And so I love to be challenged. And I love it when people say, look, nah, I kind of disagree with you on that. And uh, and then have a bit of a healthy discussion. And uh, it's just such a lovely place to, uh, to be in the EV community. I know this is a, a digression. 
but it's kind of nice because like the Twitters and the Facebooks, it's pretty rough and tumble and it's full of negativity. I think, um, you know, the EV community largely uh, stay away from the whole Tesla longs and shorts and bulls and bears and kind of craziness around all of that. Largely, really, really positive, supportive community that everybody that I <laughs> kind of bump into online and then become friends with in, you know, in the real world. Let's get on to what we're talking about, our community section and question of the week this week. Here's an interesting one. Does the location of production influence your buying decisions? Yes, no. Tell me why. Would you only buy an American car if you live in the USA? Would you, are you, if you're listening in Europe, more likely to buy a European car? Despite what many of the European manufacturers have been doing, which, if I'm being generous, I'll say has been very, very naughty. And But are you still proud of your domestic automaker? If you listen in France, would you always buy a Renault? Let me know your thoughts. Does location of production influence your buying decisions and why? Certainly, if you go to California, you're in Tesla country. If you're anywhere near Fremont, if you're in San Francisco, if you're in the Bay Area, if you're in Silicon Valley, you're in Tesla country, so you're going to see plenty of them. Let me know your thoughts, and you can do that by emailing me. It's hello, H-E-L-L-O, hello, at evnewsdaily.com. Radio. Time for the endy bit. Thank you to 214 patrons of the podcast. We use a website called patreon.com slash evnewsdaily to help make this show. Well, not help, but it does make this show. If you want to check out what it's all about, thank you as always to our premium partners, Phil Roberts of Electric Future and Brad Crosby as well. Thank you so much. There are 476 previous shows online, which you can listen to anytime you want to. We keep them online. Uh, that's what the funding goes towards and the new shows as well. Uh, check them out and also subscribe so you get them first and free and automatically and then you'll be the first one to listen. In the meantime, come and say hi on socials by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. <laughs>